This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, 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 Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. What a fantastic show today. Um, the, the sound booth is actually crowded. It's been a long time because everybody's been spread through the winds all over the place. So I'm here with Kim and our dear friend Mark Moss, as well as Sarah. And we're discussing a very important subject, something I know nothing about. And it's a guy named Klaus Schwab and the WTF. Or is it WEF? Uh, WEF. It should be WTF. W-E-F. But anyway, it should be WEF. World Economic Forum is what it stands for, but what the, I, the WTF I, I, is good too. I think WTF is more, more accurate. accurate yes. But we all know what that means, but we're not allowed to say because we might get censored. But anyway, the subject is hot enough that we could get deplatformed anyway for this one. And I was listening to Mark Moss and I was going, oh my God, he knows a lot about this. And I don't know much about Klaus Schwab and the WEF or WTF, what do you want to call it? So uh, we thought I'd, we'd bring him in. He is in Phoenix right now. And to clarify it, because Mark is a researcher, Supreme, and I was listening to his program on it. I thought all of you should hear what he has to say. What do you think, Kim? Well, I'm always fascinated to talk to Mark because he has a wealth of information and, and you study history. Um, And so you look back on what's happened and how history repeats itself again and again and again. Of course, this is this is in a time where we've never seen before. So I'm really looking forward to your take on what's happening. And I'm also looking forward to your take on Klaus Schwab, because I've been studying some of his things and the WEF and all of his shenanigans that are hurting the world right now. So let's talk about what is WEF anyway. Let's with, well, first off, what's WTF? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, That's really the most accurate statement. I, I, I say that because there's a, a cool website by a couple of buddies I have. It's called WTF Happened in 1971.com. Right. That's a good one. You've been there. You've seen that, right? No, no, no. Okay, I, agree. So I agree. It, it, all it is is just a bunch of charts. So it's a web page, WTF Happened 1971, and all it is is charts. And it shows since 1971 what's happened with the income inequality, the obesity rate, the incarceration rate, the divorce rate, the uh, in, uh, you know medium income, uh, debt levels, everything since 1971. Why since 1971? It's the year we got off the gold standard. So you can see, so it's just, it's a hundred charts that show what the WTF happened in 1971. And you can see it, it's just like crazy. Well, what's, the name of, what's the name of this book? W, it, it's a website, WTF happened in 1971. Good, and the reason why I start with that, which you said WTF, is because when was the World Economic Forum founded? 1971. Oh, wow. What? Is that true? WTF happened in 1971. Wow. And so uh, the whole world went off the rails in 1971. When you distort the money, you get all types of distortions. And, and, and one of those is seen like a WTF, a WEF. Well, the good news is, you know, I got mine because it was in 1972. I realized what had happened. Mm-hmm. I was flying in Vietnam. And that's when I went on the gold standard. And I bought my first little Kruger in uh, Hong Kong for about 50 bucks. Well, no, you never left the gold standard, see? The dollar left yeah. the gold standard. Yeah. You we just didn't. jumped we didn't. So, it, so it, for Mar- it was good news for me. <laughs> so, Mark, a lot of people don't know who Klaus Schwab is yeah. or WEF. Can you just give us a little history on that? Yeah, so um, a lot of people might have heard of something like Davos, where every year the world leaders, <clears throat> they like to, a lot of people call them the world elite. I don't like to use that word. They're not elite in anything. None of us would hire them in our business. But the world leaders, the, the, the policy makers, if you will, the think tankers, they get together every year in Davos. And so you hear like the Davos man uh, in reference or something and they so go, it's politicians it's business leaders all of that it's poli- it's both because uh po- what their policy is is this uh, public private partnership public private partnership that's this whole public, thing private okay so it's it's okay. politicians okay. and business people okay. getting together public and private getting together to set policy so they get, they get together every year uh in in davos switzerland at the world economic forum and so it was founded by this guy klaus schwab who um He's a uh, German. His father has uh, deep ties into Nazi Germany, obviously. Uh, There's deep ties there. He studied under um, Henry Kissinger, and uh, he's created this think tank, bringing these people together to try to figure out a better way, a more equitable way to run the world. Watch out. Anytime you see that word equitable, you know what they're talking about. They're talking about Marxism. And so what really what he's done is he's just taken the same ideas. You said we haven't seen this before, but of course we have. It's the same ideas being rehashed. And so it's globally. just globally. globally. And so it's just Marxism all over. So they get the world leaders together. The 
the politicians, the public, and the private, and they come together in what he's calling stakeholder capitalism. Stakeholder capitalism. So instead of, uh, we talked about last night at dinner, how Rothbard said that businesses should focus on profit. He says, no, no, business shouldn't focus on profit. Business should focus on the, um, the community, ESG, environmental, social, governance. We should be equitable. And so um, basically distorted all these things, but they want to do it through power, through control, forcing people to comply instead of educating people and showing people better ways. And so they've done it um, through the public private partnership. So basically through the money. So now if you don't fall in line with what their policies are, well, no money for you, no investment for you. Right. Um, and, and if these big companies don't follow along with their policies and push these things down, they don't get the funding and then they basically get pushed out of the, out of the. Uh, so let's, let's step back a little bit. So who is Mark Moss? That's a good question. Well, um, I'm just a, I'm just someone that grew up reading Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, and uh, it's a good answer. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I've said many times. I think uh, I, I got on this like personal development path. I read um, uh, How to Think and Grow Rich, and that was the first book that kind of. Sh- pushed me over. And then I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And like those two books basically kind of sent me off into this angle. And I'm, uh, I'm just company. Yeah. I'm just somebody who's, uh, who's, uh, I, I figured out how to make a lot of money when I was young. I started buying bank owned repos when I was 18 years old. And, uh, luckily my network was my net worth. I had a friend who was doing it. He didn't teach me, but I saw that it was possible. I started buying bank owned repos, zero down. The bank was just trying to get rid of them. This is 1995. Um, I made a lot of money. I built two businesses, one in a, one in an internet business out of the dot-com boom or bust, I should say, uh, one medical business in 2008. I got hammered, you know, in 2008, like everybody, I, I, uh, I was really good at making money, but I didn't understand this financial system. Like what the heck just happened to me? And so WTF. W- <laughs> exactly. WTF happened to me. I, I, I was good at making money, but I didn't realize there was these forces that had control over my life that I wasn't really paying attention to. The macro. The macro. And so for the last 12 years, I've studied the macro. I learned a concept called uh, wealth transfers. Money doesn't disappear. It transfers. And so when I lost my wealth, somebody else got that. I didn't like that. <laughs> that's a very good point. I didn't like that. And so I- And that's rea- happening today. And it's happening today. And so I realized there's certain times and conditions where these wealth transfers happen. And so I've spent the last 12 years studying these wealth transfers to figure out how do I get on the receiving end instead of being on the receiving end of those things. So wh- wh- where'd you grow up? Yeah, yeah so, so I, I grew up in Southern California. California. Where, where in Southern in, California? Uh, in Orange County. I, I lived in Texas until I was in junior high, and then I moved to California with my parents. My dad uh, had to, we had to leave California because the real estate market crashed. He was in construction. California was booming, so we went out there and uh, grew up on the beach surfing, uh, a little bit uh, similar to your, your upbringing, right, on the beach, um, which is a good life. Um, and so, yeah, so I live in Southern California, I have a family, I have a couple kids that I'm trying to raise up the right way. My daughter's going to be splashing on the scene here pretty soon. You'll be, you'll be seeing and hearing from her soon. Um, I think that's a great idea that, you know, you... We, we educate our kids, not the teachers. Yeah. And if we don't do that, we're in trouble, big trouble. Yeah. So anyway, thank, thank, I'm glad you're doing that. And so how did you get into the education piece yeah. and kind of getting, trying to figure out what's going on today and we're going to get into what we can do to turn this thing around? Yeah. So um, after, after making a bunch of money and then ha- building a couple of businesses and then losing a bunch of money, um, I was like, I got to figure this out. And so... Um, you know, when your pain is high enough, you'll figure out a way. And so I just started digging into what, what, what was I missing in my education? We talked about that. I vowed to my family like this, my wife and I, my young daughter at the time, I like, this will never happen to me again. I'm going to figure this out. Trust me. Um, and so I just started pouring into that about, uh, I started investing in or buying all these investment newsletters and, you know, every, every piece, I, I became a gold bug, you know, got, got onto Mike Maloney and I figured it was the fiat money system. That was the problem. And now I'm a gold bug and et cetera. Um, and then, uh, in 2015, I started buying Bitcoin. And uh, really, I also have to credit uh, Sovereign Man. Shout out to Sovereign Man. He was really influential in kind of building out this like uh, uh, worldview where I needed to decentralize my life. And I was in the process of setting up offshore bank accounts and trusts um, in Panama. And I looked at Bitcoin. I said, well, this is kind of the same thing. I get my money out of the bank. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. So I got into that and, and uh, I, I started writing a cryptocurrency research newsletter from 2016 to 2019. I personally researched and published over a thousand pages of, of research on every single crypto project that was how, out how there. Did you, how did you look, what, what prepared you to become a researcher? That's a whole curiosity. Really? 
curiosity. You know, I had, I had been, uh, I had been in investing or buying these investment newsletters for now at this point, whatever, seven, eight years. And so I had seen how it's done. I'm reading these research reports, you know, hundreds and hundreds of research reports from other people. So you kind of start to figure out how to put it together. Did you, did you go to college and all that? Nah, nah, I didn't go to college. I, um, I, answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't go to college. Uh, my parents really wanted me to go to college and, um, I didn't. And, uh, you know, I tried, unfortunately I have to say this, especially to like my kids, like I, I am not a fan of college. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't like education. Yeah, exactly. Correct. I just wanted to learn what I wanted to learn. I didn't want to learn this other stuff. And more importantly, I wanted to learn it and I wanted to apply it. So I'm learning and people ask me, as I'm sure they ask you all the time, like, what book should I read? And it's like, well, what are you trying to learn? And so typically if I'm hiring people, I'll read a book on management. Maybe if I am trying to scale my business, I might read a book on marketing, um, you know, and so you're learning what you need and then you apply it. And then if you can't even teach it, which is even better, right? And so, uh, yeah, so I, it was, it was out of necessity though, right? So mother necessity is the mother of invention. So I needed to know what was going on. Um, no one else cared about me as much as I cared about myself. So I poured in myself and I've read, you know, a thousand books. Well, your, your, uh, your information is timely, priceless, accurate, uh, which I appreciate. So, um, uh, how much time we have a break here? Three minutes. Okay. So let's, let's get back to our, my what does yeah. Kissinger have to do with Klaus Schwab? That's and, my and the question. whole great reset. Yeah. So I think um, I, I, I reference quite often what Henry Kissinger said, which was uh, maybe a, a warning to the world, but I think it was more of a of a call to arms on their side. So he said, if you control the food, you control the people. If you control the energy, you control the continent. If you control the money, you control the world. And then, well, let's, let's back up. A lot of people don't know who Kissinger was. Oh, he's still around. He's still alive. He's still right? alive. Yeah, he's still alive. Who he's, was he? He's pretty old. Well, he's, he's Secretary of State, right? For Nixon. Yeah. So he, you he know, opened the door to China. Opened the door to China, but also, you know, uh, instrumental throughout Europe as well. Um, during that time of the, you know, coming out of the World War II, kind of redrawing the world and, and setting peace and stuff like that. Um, so he was very influential, and he still is today, right? He's, and he was teaching at was it MIT or Yale or one of the big college, one of the big universities is where Klaus Schwab. Yeah met him and studied under him. That's right. That's right. So Klaus Schwab studied under him. I, f I forget which university it was, but um, yeah, he studied under him. And so he's carried on the same, the philosophy. the same philosophies. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, people say, oh, you're drawing, you're, 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 you're cherry picking data. Well, really like what are the attack vectors today? So food, <laughs> we're running out of food. The, per the UN, they say 800, I think it's 868 million people could starve to death in the next 24 months. Well, you look at what's happening in Sri Lanka today. Yeah. Do you know, there's rioting going on and all this because it's corruption. And yeah. basic corruption is what it is, but they're starving. Yeah, they're starving. And, and the Ukraine is going to starve a lot of people. They're, they're starving and they have no energy. And so the, and the it, whole Green New Deal is, is killing so, our energy. So, so Sri Lanka has the, the best ESG score in the world, 98 out of 100. <laughs> Great. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> they passed the test. Yeah. Just yeah. like uh, school. The, it means nothing. They had, they had put out an article um, um two years ago said that by 2025, they were gonna be one of the richest nations, they were gonna be the poster child for ESG, uh, and it was on the WF website. They'd and set, ESG stands for? Uh, environmental, social, and governance. So they'd give you a score based off of these three metrics, uh, how environmentally sound you are, environmentally uh, low impact <sighs> on environment, uh, your social, how's your social score, and then your governance. Do you have diversity on your board, and all of these things. And um, so they were they were gonna be the poster child for this. They, they proclaimed that we we will be the best by 2025. They said by 2025, we'll be one of the richest nations in the world based off of this sustainability. Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka. coming apart of the seams right now. Well, no, they're 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 they're, gone. they're completely gone. Yeah, they they defaulted on their bonds. They got no money. Nobody will loan them any more money. They don't have any money to import any energy, so they have no energy. So they went the path that the Great Reset is all about, and they're gone. And they're gone. That Just should like say that. something. So who? Um, let me ask this: Who came up with ESG? Do you know? Uh, I'm not exactly sure who who started ESG. It, it came out of the the, the WEF, the WEF, we'll call it, the WEF uh, camp, um, and it came out of that. Uh, it, it's just a way to control people. So are you saying Kissinger, how would you classify his political core? Is it fascist? Power and control. But it's fascist. Yeah, fascist. I think uh, those labels are difficult, right? They're, they're fascist, uh, sure. Do you, do you know where he got his education or his 
ideolo- ideology? Uh, I don't, but I but I, but I can see like the the world that he grew up in, right? So World yeah. War One, World War Two. So that shaped his worldview. I don't yeah. know exactly who he studied. But the under. reason the reason I, I was shocked when you just said that I'm going because when I was a kid, he was extremely well respected. Oh yeah, you know he was Nixon. He was doing all these global initiatives and all that stuff. And then to hear him associated with Klaus Schwab, who I don't know much about anyway, and then then Schwab was a student of Kissinger. It makes what you and I and we teach and so many guys like George Gammon and Kenny Mack makes what we teach more important. Yeah. Because we teach freedom of cap and capitalism. And these guys te- teach fascism. Communism. Communism. So we'll come back. We'll be talking more with Mark Moss. Um, very important subject here. Klaus Schraub and the WTF. And the Great W-E-F, Reset. What do you want to say it? But I, I'm doing this not because I want to get hit, hit with a drone strike here. But we, we, I think we have to know. And that's why I was very impressed with what Mark was doing on his interview with the WEF and Klaus Schwab. We'll be right back. The Rich Dad Company's mission is to elevate the financial well-being of humanity. And one of the ways we do this is through the Rich Dad Radio Show. The first investing tip we tell our listeners is to make sure their portfolio is diversified. One way to do this is by investing in companies that are themselves diverse. Companies that operate around the globe, companies that are innovative, or companies that provide differentiators in the respective category. Even better, invest in companies that meet all three areas, like Akamai. Akamai makes life better for billions of people, billion times a day, through their cybersecurity, cloud, and edge solutions. They have everything that investors look for in a company that has long-term stock value. Strong financials, a global platform, diversified across products, and a leader in the security space. To learn more about Akamai, visit their website, akamai.com slash richdad. That's A-K-A-M-A-I dot com slash richdad. And make sure to explore all the ways you can keep your portfolio diverse. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait, access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And today we have the WTF show. I mean, (laughs) I wanna know what's going on. And uh, I suspected it was gonna get bad. You know, most of my books like, like your buddy, uh, what's his name at uh, Freedom Fest? Um, uh, I won't mention his name, but he no. hates me yeah, because he, like <laughs> <laughs> he hates me at Freedom Fest because he, there's no freedom at Freedom Fest. I cannot say what I want to say. I said this, this we're going to crash big time. Yeah. So I wrote Rich Dad's Prophecy and all this in 2008. Damn right, it crashed. And we're still crashing today. Dalio says we're now in a depression. So that's that's why I speak what I said. And so at Freedom Fest, even I got censored there. So what's happening to America? So we're here with uh, Mark Moss. I mean, he did a report on the this guy named Klaus Schwab, which I've only heard rumors about. So that's why this program is a very important show to find out what's going on. And Mark's got his new book called Uncommunist Manifesto. That's right. It just un- came out. The Uncommunist. The Uncommunist Manifesto. So... So uh, who is this guy, Klaus Schwab, one more time, and what are they really up to? Yeah, so founded the WF, the World Economic Forum. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important to understand, too, like where we're at in the world, right, where this peak centralization, central planning. Right. I like to say central planning always fails and uh, because they don't have enough data. They know they don't have enough data. Um, you can't organize uh, billions of people, right? And, but they're trying to. And so central planning, so it's World Economic Forum, World Health Organization, World Trade Organization. Fauci, Fauci? Yeah. UN? World, world, UN? Me, world Meteorological Association. And then, yeah, the UN, the IMF, the BIS. What's the BIS? So that's the... Bank of International Settlements. The Bank of International Settlements that nobody knows what the BIS is. And the BIS- It's a central bank, central bank. The central bank of central banks, exactly. And so if you look at an org chart, I have a, in a presentation I gave, I think it was at, uh, it was at George's conference. I had an org chart of the way I see the world. And on the org chart, the BIS sits at the top. 
below the BIS, um, then you have uh, then you have some of these think tanks. So the World Economic Forum is is one of them, um, the Club of Rome, and so they're the policy makers. And then they push it down to the next row in the org chart to the policy uh, enforcers, which are the governments. And so the governments sit a few levels down. So it's really a coup of the bankers. And they use this banker, the BIS at the top, to p push these ideas through the um, think tanks and then down to the poly enforcers. And then we're down at the bottom of the subjects of all that, right? Um, and so um, so Klaus, Klaus is kind of running this. Um, he's sitting in, on top of the world, hobnobbing with all these people, flying their private jets over to Davos, telling us that we need to cut back on our energy, um, telling us that we need to uh, eat the bugs, this is on their website. They're talking about why we should be eating bugs or more sustainable. Yeah, I've, I've seen was it, it uh, Kim Basinger or no? Who was uh, Nicole Kidman? Uh, t Nicole Kidman. There was a uh, she made a commercial I think two weeks ago of her actually eating bugs. That's what they're putting on TV now. Because okay, so so food. We were talking about yeah. food. <laughs> so food. Okay, so bugs let's go. Food. Let's talk about food. What's happening? So yeah. we talked about Sri Lanka. Yeah. What's happening in Europe? Yeah. So let's talk about food. So the food is the first attack vector. Right. So um, uh, I, I was on Fox Business two weeks ago. They asked me about an article the UN put out, and the UN titled the article um, "Why It's Good to Be Hungry." Why hung Why being hungry is good. And they were saying we need people to be starving because there's all these jobs that have to be done that nobody would do unless they were starving. Who said that? It was It was an article on the UN website. Wow. Wow. And uh, like I said, Fox had me on to talk about it. They, they took it down after half a day because the backlash was so insane. Uh, but on the per the UN, about 868 billion, uh, million people um, could starve to death in the next 24 months, almost a billion. So in the next 24 months. Yeah. And so at a time. So Marxism, whenever Marxism has been tried in, in uh, Russia in the early 1900s, about 25 million people starved to death in Mao's Great Leap Forward, about 50 million people starved to death. Those were those were horrific. 50 million people. And they killed them, too. We're talking about almost a billion now. And so at a time when we have almost a billion people that could be starving to death, shouldn't we be trying to get as much food as possible out? We would try to do everything we can. But in Holland, they've gone and shut down the farms. They've taken over, they're trying to take over their land and they want to take over the farms and stop them from growing, um, not just food, but also um, raising cattle and meat. Um, and so now it's massive protests are happening in Holland at a time where we need more food. In the United States, the farmers are being paid not to plant. They're not allowed to plant on most of, uh, on some of their land. And they went and they petitioned the secretary, secretary, of, secretary of agriculture and said, hey, let us plant. We can get more food. And they said, no. It's not in line with our agreement for the Paris Accord. The Paris Accord. The Paris. Which is the environmental thing. Which is the environmental thing, which is what President Trump had pulled us out of. And then Biden's very first day in office, the most important thing he had to do by executive order was put us back into the Paris Accord. So we can't grow food in the United States because of, you know, climate change. Holland can't grow food. Um, and now the protests are happening all over the all over the world, and and then and it's even bigger. So like in in all throughout Europe, there's an energy crisis going on. Everybody should know that by now. I've been talking about it for two years, um, and they don't have natural gas. They're dependent on Russia for natural gas. But we need natural gas in Europe to make fertilizer, and we need fertilizer to grow food. <laughs> We also need we also need natural gas to process food. Okay, what well, what are the three things that what did the kitchen service say? Yeah, so food, and then, and then the next one is the energy, and the next one is and then the money. Right, and that's what Rickers is talking about. Yeah, the uh, CBDC, yeah. central bank digital currency. I read a story at, uh, on the thing on energy, and this farmer was told, "Oh, you have to put, turn all your equipment to um, electric by a certain time, by like within the year." He goes, "Oh, well, that's fine, except." I run 24 hours a day during the harvest and I have to have these these um, vehicles here at this time. And if I one breaks down, how do I get it? You know, it's like no thought given at all. Just, oh, you have to be electric. Yeah, it's it's impossible. I mean, it's impractical and it's not going to work. And it's uh, to your point, it's going to put more farmers out of business. I'm, I'm constantly reminded by an Ayn Rand quote from Atlas Shrugged, where she says, if you if uh, when you when you must receive permission to produce from men who produce nothing. Right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, when not that I'm a lawyer or anything, but when I studied business law, this uh, intent is everything. Yeah. You know, you can do you can make, you can you can do something, and make a mistake, or was it intentional? There's two different stories there. What's the intent of Kissinger, Klaus Schwab, and that like Trudeau Soros. was part of this camp too, right? Uh, Prime Minister, sure. Sure. young, sure. young, yeah. You know, I, this is something I struggle with a lot, and and I and I ask on my videos quite often. Is it? Do you think it's? Is it? Is it stupid or is it evil? And uh, a lot of I, people, I go with evil. <laughs> 
it's both, right? So there's certainly people that know what they're doing and it's evil. And then I think there's a lot of people that have just come up in the system and they're just brainwashed by it. But uh, in the Avengers, they had this, uh, this uh, the, the, enemy, the evil guy was Thanos. And he came up with this theory where he had to kill half the world in order to save half the world, right? We had to, we had to get rid of half the population. So it was kill half the world to sit, to actually save the world. And I feel that's where they are at. They feel that this is a necessary sacrifice and they're telling us as much. I mean, the secretary of the energy for the United States is on TV telling people we get it. Gas prices are expensive. You can't afford to drive, but it's necessary. It's necessary for the transition. So they're saying for the this, greater good. For the greater good. I mean, Putin's saying that every Americans must sacrifice and must suffer because we have to defeat Russia. It's for the greater good. But the Achilles heel is that third one, which is the money the supply. Money. And that's the big one. That's and that's what I wrote about in Capitalist Manifesto. It's it's this book here, um, the Central Bank. Yeah. Of the United States was founded in 1913. Guess what else was founded in 1913? Tax uh, department. The, yeah, the, fe the Federal Reserve and the IRS. Yep. And so you, when you look at all this, and then if you read Marx, he says that a progressive income tax is necessary for the spread of communism. And then when they cut off, when they cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, inflation went through the roof. Now the poor are already poor, but when you raise inflation, the price of fuel, the middle class got poor. And now when I shop, I look around and I go to the retailers, they're on sale, everything's on sale. I can't help myself, but I'm having a great time. But I feel for the retailers right now because the customers are going broke. So it, is the intent evil? In, in the Communist Manifesto, number five, he had 10 points. Number five was the creation of a central bank. Right. So central banks are part of Marxism. Of course. That's the whole goal. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's what I wrote in my manifesto. The central bank is communism, mm -hmm. central controlled economy. Yeah. And the American system, well, not, not Americans, but most people are completely uninformed. Oh, totally uninformed, totally uninformed. So let me ask you this. You know, there's a lot of talk about what you do and how you prepare and how you get food and you buy gold and all of this, but this is, there, there's a bigger what to do. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do? How do we, is this, is it possible to, to, turn this thing around or? Yeah, yeah. So it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So if you're just trying to protect yourself and like, can I, can I, can I go live on a mountaintop yeah. myself till I die? Yeah. Or am I going to try to save the world? Right. And so, this, so I'm trying to save the world, right? We're on different things. Um, in, in the book, the, uh, the Uncommonist Manifesto, we did our same 10 points and point number four was the abolition of any and all central banks. So we just say, we need to end it. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously you guys are educators and I've now become an educator. And I think that we, I think good ideas win because they're better. And I think if we can have good, intelligent discussion, then we can turn the tide on this thing. And so I think that we need to highlight how bad and disastrous these ideas are and then show that there are better ideas out there. Now, they've done a really good job of taking over the education system. So when communism was defeated in the 70s and really started in about the 60s, it kind of went underground and it came into the universities in the United States. And so they've done a really good job playing this long game and they started with changing the college age kids viewpoints on these things who have now moved into media, who have now moved into government, who have and now moved into finance. And this is going back, this goes back to what, the 60s? The 60s, yeah. yeah. So it actually it was 1930 that the uh, Frankfurt School sent teachers to Columbia University's Teachers College and that's when it spread. Okay. Because in the 60s, I remember Columbia first time rioting. I'm going, why are they rioting? You know what I mean? But it was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. It was against the Vietnam War, and then when I came back from Vietnam, I got hit with eggs and spit on and called baby killer. It was college kids. Yeah. And it's not, it's not improved. Now, now we have TikTok. Yeah. And TikTok is scrambling. It's turning their brains into scrambled eggs. It is. It's bad. But and it's a Chinese organization. Well, we can use those. We can use those tools, and we've talked about that extensively, and we and we and we will. So I think um, I think we have to use their same playbook, fight fire with fire, if you will, right? And so get back into the education and start changing their mind um, now. I think also the one thing that we have to our advantage is their ideas don't work. Left to their own, they fail. That's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. So Nietzsche says, uh, that which is falling, shall ye also push. And so it's already fallen. The system's crumbling. The financial system is done. Like the EU is on the verge of breaking up. The bond problem that they have is one that they probably can't solve over there. Um, the pigs nations down below, they, they're done. Germany has you know, lost its position. The, the energy is too high. So the EU is on the verge of breaking who, who up. Who are the pigs? Uh, the Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain. So the southern nations in, in, in the European Union. 
you know, Italy and Greece have to constantly be bailed out. They don't have any production. Germany has been the production engine of Europe, but now they've become a net importer. Because of the, the energy prices have gone so high that they can't afford to produce anymore and they have to import their energy. But why do they have to import their energy? Well, they shut all their nuclear reactors off. And they and decide, when did they do that? Uh, well, over the last decade, they've been shutting them down. And so their energy prices have gone up by eight times when next door France, they still have cheap power because they still have nuclear. So in Europe, they have, they have, they have massive amounts of shale um, gas like we do in the United States, but they don't, they don't want to get it out. So do you see, like, let's go back to Holland, which we think of as a peaceful nation, more right. or less. What are they doing to fight back there? Yeah, so it's, uh, it, uh, what they've done, and, and uh, you know, humans can take a lot of abuse from governments, but when you can't eat or feed your family, that's when it's like game on, right? Uh, nine meals to anarchy, they say. You don't eat for nine <laughs> meals, it, it's on, right? Well, three for me. Yeah. <laughs> So um, what, they're, what they've been doing is uh, they've been taking to the streets, sort of like we saw in Canada with the truckers, but now it's the farmers with their tractors. And they're taking these tractors and they're making the Canadian truckers look like child play. I mean, they, I mean, they are out in serious droves. Um, some of the farmers got arrested. The farmers went to the police station, surrounded them, and made them release the farmers. They've been filling up the city uh, with uh, manure. They, blo <laughs> they block the airports. The fishermen have gotten involved. Now the fishermen are blocking the ports. I even saw, I even saw the farmers broke into the military base and started dragging jets out of the military and putting them on the roads to block. <laughs> Good for them. But okay. now, but now it's spread to Poland. It's spread to Germany. They're it's, doing the same thing. They're all doing, so it's, it's, all it's, the farmers are uniting in protest. So it's backing up. It's, it's, it's like the drain got clogged and now it's backing up on Klaus Schwab and buddies. Yeah. And so now they're like, well, if we can't grow food, then, you, then no food. So you get no food then. And uh, the shelves are bare. And they're feeling the pain. Well, the last time I was in Hawaii, they said, "What do you think is going to happen?" I said, "I hope you like." <laughs> I said, "I hope you like the taste of human flesh." <laughs> then nobody laughed on that one. But, <laughs> well, because Hawaii is an island, they yeah. they import most of everything they eat. And you know what? What too is is okay. So first, it was the truckers, right? Truckers in Canada, truckers in the U.S. Now it's the farmers. So you look at who the cru critical people are in the world: farmers, mm -hmm. and then truckers have to get the food from the farm to the people. Uh, it's it's it actually is a big wake up call for. And then we have we have me. Jim Records coming on in a few days on Rich Dad Radio, and we'll be talking to him about CBDC, which is central bank digital currency, which is spyware. It's much like TikTok is, yeah. and so that our it's job again, is control. Yeah, but our job is to wake people up and then fight back using the same technology, which I agree with. Let's fight back with education and information. What would you say, Mark, to somebody who right now they're, they, you know, they've been scared to death mm -hmm. and they're afraid to speak out? I mean, I talked to a, a very well-known nonprofit mm -hmm. and they're very, to, they're very much in the right. They're very much pro-freedom, pro-constitution, all of this. And, and they told me their donors, people that donate money to them, want to do it anonymously because they're afraid to be associated with this pro-freedom, pro-constitution, pro-free market organization. Yeah. What do you say to somebody who's so afraid? I mean, they're going to just get annihilated if they don't do something. Put a second mask on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, I, there's a couple things. I think one, um, I gave you that story last night about racking the shotgun. So not everybody's our target. There's a few people that are standing up. And if you look back at, at you know, the Revolutionary War in the United States, for example, there was the min it was the minority that, that forced that revolution to happen. Um, so we don't need to reach the masses. We it was just, less than 5%. Less than 5%. We just need that small irate minority we talked about last night. So um, people need to join. People need to stand up. You're standing up. We're standing up together. Um, some people are a little bit afraid. What would I say to them? So I would say, one, my grandfather was decorated in World War II, right? Uh, his Marine base got uh, bombed. My father flew jets in Vietnam. Um, I thought I would just go to war one day. That was my lineage. Um, I mean, look at those boys storming the beach in Normandy. Their friends are getting blown up by them. And now today people are afraid to say something. So I'd say, first of all, stop being a victim, slap yourself and pull your boots up. Uh, but for those that are still afraid, then just support other people who are willing to stand up. And so if you want to, if you want to um, do it anonymously, then do it anonymously, but at least do something, at least support others who are willing to stand That's up. A good very point. Good point. That's a really good, very point. good point. I just go, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I wanted to, I, I wanted to not comply with the whole, you know, lockdowns and all of that. And I didn't want to be arrested, but I saw some people were willing to be arrested and I was donating money to those people to help them with their right. legal funds. Right. And it's funny that I, I support politicians who stood up. I don't care what they, I don't know what party they are, but do they stand up? Yeah. And uh, I've gone through a number of arguments in our neighborhood. Because 
So I've heard. Final words from Mark, and then Sarah will, will chime in. And then uh, we'll go back more into what we can do with WTF. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Today, our guest is Mark Moss, and he's one of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest authorities on the WTF, the World Economic Forum. And we're talking about what you can do to fight back, because I personally believe we're at a war right now. Any comments, Kim? Well, I, no, I do. I like, And I really like what you said, Mark, about um, people who are afraid, who don't want to stand up, that then support people who are standing up. Because we, we need that. And it, I think we talked earlier um, about the Internet and how the Internet could be a great tool for disseminating this information and getting it out to more and more of the masses. Because there's more of us than there are, there are them. Yeah, exactly. um, so, yeah. And, and then what, what else happened just recently? I gave you that article last night, who they're targeting in Congress. And one of those, my really good friend, you know, Marine three-star general. Congressman, they're targeting him. Mm-hmm. So we already donated to the max, but we can also donate on the other side of it to support him. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. They're interesting. All of the people on that on that sheet that you gave me are all military. They were all they were all military people who are Congress and Senate, and they're targeting the military because I think military's tough, and they're going to stand up and they're going to fight back, and they don't want that. And the guy who put it together is a Navy SEAL. Yes. So that's why we support. You know, we've got to fight back. If you're if you're going to wear a triple mask and all that stuff, <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah. But vote with your money. You know, support those who fight back. And and there's some good ones. I mean, you know, Jim Jordan, he's he's really out there fighting. You know, Rand Paul, he's out there fighting. So we have some good ones, and definitely definitely support them. Um, even you know, Ron DeSantis. I mean, uh, neither of us are in his state, but I have no problem helping support him as well. And so we have to stand up together. Um, but back to the point that you just made, though, is that um, you talked about supporting them with our money. Um, without freedom of payments, without freedom of money, there is no freedom at all. So we're guaranteed a freedom of speech, but if I don't have money to buy a phone or go on the internet or print a pamphlet or build a website, I have no freedom of speech. And if I have freedom of assembly, but I can't pay to put gas in my truck to drive to the assembly, I have no freedom of assembly either. But the reason we're having um, Jim Records on, you know, a come, few coming next Rich Dad Radio programs, is if we go to CBDC, a central bank digital currency, and they find out we're supporting, like my friend, Marine Three Star General Bergman, yeah. they can shut me down. Sure, well, they just prevent the payment from ever happening yeah. in the first yeah. place. Well, well, then they'll track me and then put a drone strike on my house. Or, or, the, or the guy in Texas who donated to the Canadian truckers and they, they froze his accounts. Right, yeah. That, that's like the SWIFT in the, um, yeah. what they did to Putin. Anyway, um, let's wrap it up right here. Sorry, got anything you want to say? Real quick thing, on uh, Palisades Gold, yeah. you did an interview, which we all studied here as a company, and one of the things you talked about was Klaus Schwab, who said, you'll own nothing and be happy. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, so uh, it, it means what it sounds like, so you'll own nothing and be happy. So what they think, what Marxism thinks is that um, if we could take away your private property, and we could ta- and, and, and you could just have everything, like live in a commune, like communism, and we could take away human desire to strive and to have more, because that's what poisons us. The, this capitalist system that makes me want to work and achieve more and Which have is more human order. nature, right? Human nature. If we can take that away, people would be happy if they're because because right now we're, we're, we're unhappy because we, we don't have what we want. We're always striving. We always have to work harder. And so if we can take that away. <laughs> uh, so but that's what they think. So you'll own nothing and you'll be happy because you won't need to strive. Nobody else. You won't see anybody else having something that you don't have. Um, and they think there's this utopia, but they don't understand there's human nature to your point. But that's what I'm asking you. Is it intent or is it a mistake? Uh, it's, it's a hundred percent intent, right? Yeah. So obviously Karl Marx wrote the book, the communist manifesto and that book has, that book, unfortunately, as far as I understand, has become the most read book in both political science and economics. Correct. And, and the, your book, let me see your book. Yeah, and so we wrote the Uncommunist, Uncommunist Manifesto. Which is basically, it's, a, it's an hour read, it's 10,000 words. Um, and it basically doesn't refute the book point by point, but rather it reframes it. And so what, um, what they said is that there's a struggle between classes, the rich and the poor, the proletariat and yep. the bourgeoisie. Yep. Um, cultural Marxism today is, it's a struggle between all classes, white and black, men and women, gay and straight, et cetera, right? Which is the same thing. It's the struggle between people, arbitrary classes. Um, we, we redefined and said, no, the, the, the real struggle, the real axis of struggle is between the individual and the collectivist. It keeps trying to pull them into these groups and take away their individual identity. Um, and so 
which is centralization. Which is centralization, Basically. right? And and uh, command and control. This is communism. Well, you know, because what these Keynesians want to do is they want to boil us down to a digit on a spreadsheet. And so these people are like this. These people are like this, and they take away the things like uh, motivation, <laughs> uh, and 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 they don't they don't take things into consideration like that that make us an individual. I believe that individualism is great. I believe individualism is necessary because if we're different, we can all see the same thing, but draw different conclusions. We see different problems and we come up with different solutions. And so we can have more progress in the world. If we're all the same, looking at the same thing, where will we have? No, inf no infinite return. Yeah, it's called free market capitalism, but more important is we're, we're fighting for our freedoms. Yeah. Like I'm afraid to speak up now. You remember during COVID, they were censoring doctors, you couldn't say anything. I don't believe that. You're not afraid. <laughs> I've heard you say some things. Other people, <laughs> other Robert's not afraid. I'm, I'm censored in this room right now. <laughs> no, it's um, it's tragic what's happening. Yeah. So we fight for our freedoms more than anything else, not for capitalism. Not, you you want to be a Marxist, be a Marxist. You want to be a tranny, have a good life. Who you sleep with, none of my business. But don't take my freedom away. Right. And that's what we stand for at Rich Dad. So anyway, I want to thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. Thank you.